G'day, Chris here and welcome back to Clickspring. One of the big problems to be solved on any project is how best to deal with oxidation. For some projects, simply sealing the surface with paint or lacquer will do the job. In others, it might even be best to simply accept it, given that patina often becomes a major part of a mechanism's long-term appeal. But at some point, a project will pop up where you'd like that freshly minted finish to last. And that's certainly the case with many clockmaking projects. The primary metal of brass is quite reactive and there's often a lot of detail that needs to be preserved from even the slightest corrosion, so that it retains its visual impact as the mechanism ages. A good example of what I mean is engraving. Immediately after the cut, engraved brass has a clean bright finish. The raised surfaces stand out nicely from the background, and were it to simply stay this way forever, we'd be as happy as could be. But of course, if left untreated, all surfaces soon begin to tarnish. And in no time at all, the detail that makes engraving a worthwhile feature of a piece quickly loses its impact. Now there are some remedies available in limited circumstances. As I mentioned, those parts that can tolerate it can be lacquered. But it's worth pointing out that lacquer doesn't last, and it would rarely be acceptable to lock up the surfaces of one section of a mechanism, for example the plates, while the rest of it is left to oxidise. In some circumstances, microcrystalline wax might also be a reasonable option. But generally speaking, if the best possible preservation of a freshly cut part is the objective, then it's going to have to be a more durable solution. And traditionally, gilding was that solution for high-end watches and clocks, with today the modern equivalent being bath electroplating, using gold or rhodium. Now of course, like anything, electroplating is a fairly straightforward process once you've had a go. But none of it is particularly obvious from the start. And the solutions and components of a useful system are not really priced for trial and error prototyping. So as someone with zero plating experience, my approach was to remove some of the variables by starting out on a small jeweler system and see what I could learn first before maybe building something larger. And the first thing worth pointing out is that it essentially replicates the larger scale industrial setups, but on a much smaller scale. It consists of a DC power source and several bath stations, each of which is much the same concept repeated at each station. A simple electrical circuit runs from the power source, through each bus bar, into the work as it hangs off the bar, through the solution, and then returns via the anode. In this system, the anodes are either nickel, stainless steel, or platinum coated titanium, depending on the solution being used. And each bath circuit is essentially ready to go, waiting for the suspension of the workpiece on the bus and its immersion in the solution to complete the circuit. There's fine control of the voltage, with the plating voltage typically quite low, ranging from between 2 and 4 volts, depending on the plating solution. And so far, I've seen the power supply cope quite okay up to around 8 amps. The bath solutions in order of use are electro cleaner, surface activator, and the plating solution. And in this case, I have two plating solutions on the go at once, nickel and gold, and I'll talk about why that is a little later in the video. Okay, so what are the main issues that affect the outcome? Well, the primary consideration before anything else is surface finish. Whatever the desired finish of the plated surface, it can only ever be as good as the surface finish immediately prior to plating. In this case, I've taken the uncut faces of these test plates to a reflective polish, and as a contrast, I've left the engraved surfaces with a 1500 grit straight brushed finish. Next up is part cleanliness, and I think that this issue is by far the most consequential in terms of outcome. Everything else still matters, but this issue is the one that will completely sink apart if it's not sorted out correctly. Electroplating is a surface deposition process, so naturally anything that impedes the deposit or causes a differential deposition rate is going to be a problem. And it's very easy to inadvertently leave a thin film of oil or contaminant on the surface as part of the polishing process or just as a result of general handling. So for this reason, the first step in the process is the electro cleaning bath. This is an alkaline solution designed to electrochemically clean the surface and wet out the part. Now ideally, the part should come out of this solution with a much reduced tendency to form a water bead on the surface. And I should point out that in between each step is a distilled water rinse stage, 
to clean off the solution and prevent cross-contamination of the next bath, which in this case is the surface activator solution. Now the documentation on this one is a little vague, but I take its role for copper-based alloys to be primarily one of surface oxide removal, to expose completely bare, chemically reactive metal. In any event, these first two solutions of electrocleaning and activating are together considered to be the pre-treatment stage of electroplating. And at this second rinse stage, a clean, bright surface with no tendency to bead should be the outcome. Now it doesn't always work out that way. Occasionally, a slight tendency to bead will remain. And if it doesn't quite look right, or if there's even a hint of a break in the surface tension, then it's best to go back to the electro cleaner stage and have another go until it looks right. Once underway, there are three main parameters that can be controlled during the plate. The first of which is solution temperature. Plating is an electrochemical reaction, and so like most chemical processes, the temperature of the solution plays a major role in the outcome. Each solution has an optimum temperature range, specified by the manufacturer, and in this case, a simple heating element and thermometer make that easy to manage. Plating voltage also plays a role. Generally speaking, it controls the rate of deposition, with a lower voltage meaning a slower deposition rate and potentially a smoother surface, and a higher voltage delivering a much more vigorous plate. Each solution has an optimum voltage identified by the manufacturer, and for these solutions it's generally between 2 and 4 volts. So this means that if temperature and voltage are considered as constants, then the plating time becomes the means of controlling both the depth and to some extent the quality of the plated surface. Now it's not quite that simple of course, because the solution itself is relevant. Gold is fairly straightforward to plate with. It deposits easily and is very forgiving. Providing the surface is well prepared and given a good finish, it's pretty hard to go wrong. But copper-based alloys have an issue, where the copper slowly diffuses through the gold plating over time, ruining its appearance. This problem is solved by pre-plating the surface with what's known as a diffusion barrier, most commonly using either nickel or palladium. My testing so far is with the cheaper of those two options, nickel. And as it happens, getting a consistently high quality result with nickel is quite the challenge. In particular, the issues I mentioned in the pre-treatment stage become super critical for nickel. Even the slightest hint of a break in the surface of the part heading into the plating stage will guarantee a substandard nickel plate. And because the underlying surface sets the stage for the subsequent gold plate, it's not going to be masked or hidden. That floor is locked in and will show up no matter what. And to make matters worse, nickel is a fairly hard material compared to either gold or brass. So it's not particularly easy to remove the nickel and try again. And of course it's even more difficult if the part is something detailed like engraving. Now the good news is that if the nickel plate goes well, then it's smooth sailing to the finish line. Gold plating over nickel is as easy and trouble free as you could hope for. And once the gold surface is locked in, then the oxidation problem is essentially solved, and the part can be handled in a far more relaxed manner. But the challenge of applying nickel as a diffusion barrier makes it clear that despite the extra expense, it's worth investigating palladium as an alternative and I'll be testing that out in the near future before I settle on the final system. Before I move on though, there's something else worth mentioning about nickel. In addition to the sensitivity to part cleanliness mentioned before, nickel also has a tendency to preferentially plate the surface closest to the anode. This means that while the near side will pick up a good plate, the far side in a single anode setup like this slightly misses out, and deeper cavities in a part are often barely plated at all. Now ideally, of course, we'd like as close to a uniform thickness to the plating as possible. And this can sort of be addressed by rotating the part in the nickel solution mid-plate. But the ideal solution is to have a multiple anode system, with the anodes opposing each other in the bath. Which brings me to the first easy mod for this little jeweler's system, which is to simply drop an additional anode on the other side of the bath. The result is a dramatic improvement in the overall performance of the system. Now the gold solution is far less sensitive to this issue, but it's worthwhile increasing anode coverage for that bath too, especially for larger parts, with the general rule being that the anode area should roughly equal the part area. Again, it's a simple case of running a lead to another anode and then dropping it into the other side of the bath. Nothing else changes. As usual, the circuit is completed by suspending the part on the DC bus and immersing it into the solution.
So with that, the next limitation to consider is the bath size itself. Which brings me to the other simple improvement for this system. I was fortunate to find containers that fit the existing wells perfectly, that at 2 litres doubled the original 1 litre capacity, permitting just that little extra depth to a part. Now this of course lifts the bus bars clear of their plugs, so it's all a bit ad hoc and untidy at the moment, with alligator clips and the bus bars sitting loose and so on. But it really wouldn't take much to tidy this up with some permanent extensions or simply with longer bus bars and anodes. Importantly, there doesn't seem to be any significant performance penalty for this volume expansion. The anodes still work fine despite the extra bath depth, and the solution heaters work just as well with the extra solution volume. It'll accommodate the vast majority of the parts that I generally deal with, with the largest part that I've plated so far being the base of the card press project. That was a 135 by 85 mm brass plate that just fit fully submerged. It took the plating well without any issues, and really the only thing that stood out was that even with the recommended voltages, the current was noticeably higher than anything I'd seen previously, with nickel peaking I think at about 8 amps. And that's probably a reasonable estimate of the capacity limit of this setup, even with the expansion. Based on that limit, it's clear that larger clock plates and frames are where I'll eventually hit a problem, and ultimately one day I'll need to take all of this up a notch to a higher capacity with rectangular baths, larger anodes, and a larger power supply. But that's a problem for another day. For now, there's still a lot to be learned from this little system, and we'll sort out that next one on a future video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.